Us. Hello. We'll uh, get started in a minute or so. Uh, in the meantime, welcome. I uh, hope everybody's safe and well in the crazy COVID world. No one knows what's happening from day to day. I see in Victoria, or oh, Frederick, I see in Victoria they're shutting down again for a few days. Uh, it's got to be tough for dojos because just when they think everything's okay, they get another lockdown. I, this can't go on forever. It's it's a bit silly, really. Um, we don't know when it'll end, whether the uh, vaccine's going to do the job. Um, you say one thing, one side of the political atmosphere thinks you're a moron. You say the other thing and the other side thinks the same thing. So you just can't win. Bush, Mike. Sunny. Finally. <laughs> If it's not bushfires, it's rain. Us. Hey, Brad. Us. Vince Le Monta. <laughs> hey, Vince. How are you, man? Us. Good to see you. Marco. Us. So a few people turning up, but that's good. Today, I just wanted to go over just a handful of little things which I think are particularly handy for uh, instructors when they're trying to get a handle on transferring the stiffness of this, <clears throat> transferring that into fluid, uh, fluid motion. Um, Ross Daniel, good to see you. Uh, you know, and it's, it's a real challenge because you see people, oh, it's Patty, good to see you, man. Hope everything's going well. Your end, another lockdown, I understand. Crazy. Um, but for instructors, one of the biggest challenges is transferring that still stance, non-moving kihon, where by its nature, if it's not done correctly, the punches actually do become arm punches. So when you're doing basics and you get lazy and all that, so instead of going and using your whole body and you, you start going rah, rah, and sometimes you just got to try and keep up with them. And so then it goes into Kumite and the next thing you know, they're going this sort of thing, you know. So that challenge for the instructor is to be able to transfer one into the other successfully and it's an ongoing issue. So today I'm just going to... Uh, I'm just going to um, go through a few of those uh, simple footwork drills and weight distribution drills. The footwork drills are just things probably most schools do, uh, but you have to quantify, you have to classify them because if you don't actually, um, New Zealand or suicide, or <laughs> good to see you, man. How are you? And Paul. And Banto Sensei. Whoa. So everybody see Dave Bunt's name there? I've got to tell you about Dave Bunt. Dave Banto, Banto Sensei. At Hombu, he was called Banto Sensei. He lived in Japan for a long time and he was training at Hombu. And everyone knows that everyone knows that I travel with Soul Size in Interpreter and all that sort of stuff. But Banto Sensei probably did just as much, not for as long, because I was there for a long time, but um, he did a lot of um, interpreting for Salsa because he was in Japan. Uh, and um, I'll tell you the little story. A few people asked about that story of uh, the photo at Niagara Falls. Well, when I went, that was in 92, and uh, I went there to interpret for Salsa. And Dave Banto, Banto Sensei is actually from New York. He was a branch chief of New York. And... I knew probably in my lifetime I'd never get back to Niagara Falls again, and that's a fair call, and I haven't. It's been 28 years, uh, and I probably won't get back again because in 28 more years I'll be 90, and uh, even if I did go back, I'd probably slip on the on the footpath. But anyway, so I took my gear. Banto Sensei and I were staying at the same hotel in um, Buffalo in New York. Ostorbian. And... Um, uh, 
before we went, I said to Dave, I'm going to take my gi just in case there's a photo opportunity. And he said, oh, okay, well, I'll take mine as well. Yeah, it was good on you, Brad. We'll go for old time's sake. We'll find that exact spot. Although I heard it's kind of not there anymore because the erosion has taken that little area that I was standing away. So anyway, Saulsai went for a walk. He went for a stroll. He likes his lone time, you know. So he's he goes off for a walk and everybody's milling around. And I looked at Dave Bunt and I said, well, it's now or never. So I quickly stripped down to my gi and I gave my camera to uh, Kobayashi Kameraman. Kobayashi Sensei, he was the professional photographer who took pretty well 90% of all the great photos you've ever seen of Solsai. Uh, he took uh, and included one or two that were in my book that Solsai gave me uh, the right to use. Um, but anyway, uh, I gave him my camera and I said, just snap a few photos. And I ran right over to the edge and there's a, there's a couple of photos still around. Unfortunately, they weren't digital, so I've misplaced a few of them. But I went right over to the edge and literally uh, like a meter away from these millions of tons of water. And I'm standing there and I'm throwing kicks and, you know, posing for the photos that Kobayashi Kameraman is taking for me. And then... I kind of pull back a little bit and I hear come it on come it on and it was also oh come it on and I look around I thought oh man I'm in big trouble here because I was fairly certain you weren't meant to be there so I've gone over with my tail between my legs my head down and I thought he was about to you know read me the riot act for bringing shame to Kyokushin <laughs> and he he says to me give me here which means lend me your gi. So as I'm taking my gi off, poor old Banto Sensei, who I was his senpai, so I pulled rank on you. Remember that day? I'm so sorry. But anyway, I, I knew I'd never get back, so I felt a little bit emboldened to ask Banto Sensei for his gi. But anyway, as I'm taking my gi off and giving it to Solsai, I look at Banto Sensei and says, you give me your gi. So I put Banto Sensei's gi on, and uh, and then I went over and saw, so I took some photos, and you've probably seen them. They're in the calendar. There's some really nice ones of him um, doing um, some movements in front of the waterfall. And then at the uh, end of the shoot, I said to Kobayashi Kameraman, is that it? He said, yeah. So I ran over to Salsa and I said, can I get a photo with you? And uh, so, oh. and so we took the photo. And that's the photo that was on Facebook today. Uh, so Solsai has my gi on. If you look carefully, he has a third Dan belt on. Uh, and it's a nice, fairly size, good size gi. Uh, and Banto Sensei was a lightweight. I was a middleweight. So his gi was too small for me, but I put it on anyway. So that's why when you look at that photo of Solsai and me two uh, together, when you look at me together, um, uh, it's also with my the, my gi, which is the one the gi that I've got on is Banto Sensei's gi, which you know is probably a size four because he was much um, he was a lightweight, and Salsa's got my gi on, and uh, the other the other funny thing is I use that photo. It's in the dojo, and when when, when wherever we're training with Stormosh Yuke, I always direct people's attention to the photo to show them the difference between how to do it right and how to do it wrong. Because Soul Size, you know, Stormwash Yuki is perfectly relaxed and balanced. And I'm a little bit nervous because I'm at Niagara Falls getting my photo taken with Soul Size. So my arms are a little bit tense and my waki's open. And, you know, and it's a perfect example of how not to do a uh, Stormwash Yuki. So anyway, but <laughs> we're a size six now. So do I, Dave. Of course. But anyway, that's Dave Banto Sensei, and he, you know, he was a very important uh, part of Hombu life when Solsai was there, and uh, uh, he was a branch chief of New York, and he was very trusted by Solsai. And as you know, not a lot of people really breached that inner circle uh, 
line of demarcation and Bonto Sensei definitely did. So also I really trusted Dave and respected his opinion and Bonto Sensei was uh, a, a teacher in Japan and he gave, Sosai gave him respect. So everyone at Hombu, even Dave Senpai, uh, would call him Banto Sensei. So uh, anyway, I also have that gi that Sosai had on too. So good question there. But anyway, Dave, look, it's probably late and it's a real thrill to have you along for the first time. Uh, but thanks for coming along. I, I said to Dave that I'll probably mention him today. So good on him. So we better get on with training because we're running out of time. We've only got... 50 minutes <laughs> but anyway look footwork footwork fundamentals body weight distribution very important body weight distribution everybody thinks us yeah thank you too dave us look forward to catching up with you again sometime um everybody thinks of body weight distribution about um weight left or right or, or is it 50 50 or 40 60 i don't mean weight distribution in a static stance. I mean weight distribution for generating power. Now kinetic energy, as you know, is half half m times v squared, half mass times velocity squared. You know, for all intents and purposes, what that means is body weight and velocity or body weight and speed. So if you want to increase power, you need to use body weight and speed optimally. Um, and remember, power is not a somatic. The somatics, what are somatics? Well, they're physical properties, speed, cardiovascular endurance, flexibility, and strength. They're the four main somatics of the human body. And all the other things like uh, agility and coordination, they're all, they're all products of the combination various combinations of those four. I had a fifth one, which is uh, specific to impact sports, not just karate, but any impact sport, uh, is what I call a sturdiness or the ability to take impact. So um, I have a, um, a book that I've worked on. It's a very small book, and I'm actually going to finalize it, and I'm going to give it away as a gift to uh, the Patreon crowd, but anyway, I call it I call it the S14, and there's the 14 concepts or principles that all start with S. The first five are universal to life, and then after that, it becomes uh, relevant to karate. But the five somatics I work on are all S's: speed, strength, stamina, uh, suppleness, and sturdiness. So power is not in there power is a product of these if your body weight is wrong you can't optimize body weight uh you can't optimize the the mass part of that kinetic energy equation um if if your technique is poor oh clarence good to see you man thanks for coming along if your technique is poor you can't optimize speed and vice versa if your speed is bad you can't uh, get the best out of your technique. I always say optimize instead of maximize because maximal power is never necessarily good. If you, if you throw a punch with maximal power but it costs you balance and defense, well, then it's, you know, it's a done deal. So the, the real key is optimization of power, not maximization of power. So anyway, I wanted to <laughs> excuse me run through a few... Concepts and drills, uh, 1980, I first, uh, I used to have a column in a magazine called Australasian Fighting Arts. Mike Clark also wrote as a, uh, as a regular um, journalist uh, for Australasian Fighting Arts. He wrote a lot more than me. I mean, he wrote lots of articles. I wrote very few, but all I did was interviews in the Cameron Quinn column. And one of the early interviews that I did was with Benny the Jet, Urkudes. And I trained with him uh, early that weekend. We had done a sen seminar, and then I had an opportunity to interview him sitting at um, a restaurant in Surface Paradise. Now, us, Mac, good to see you, man. You're up early. 
So Dave Bonto Sensei is up late, and Mac, you're up early. Good on you. Uh, so anyway, uh, and Benny's movement concepts are very, very solid, very, very solid principles of movement. And one of the things that he taught me was how to distribute your balance correctly to maximize your power. Nothing big. If you if you hit um, properly, you'll be doing it naturally. But a lot of people never learn to do it. So let's just start off, first of all, um, with that. My legs are shaky, of course. So with that idea of optimizing power by uh, distributing weight. Us. Thanks for training. If you're joining in, do so. We'll have a little bit of a stretch. Not much because you should have already stretched. One, two, three. Under each knee, sun, squatting. Each knee, sun, she. I didn't train this morning either, so uh, I'm a bit tight. It's me, so she. I wore a, a smaller pair of gear pants today so you can see my ankles when I'm moving. It's pretty important. Double shoulder width. Relax, remember. I use all these acronyms, acronyms galore. And the acronym for stretching is grab a stretch. And the G stands for gravity and your gaze. So let gravity do the work for you. Just relax into it. And the more you can relax and let gravity do the work for you, and you'll always get more beneficial results from a stretch. Oh, Brad Hansen. Guess who's back training with us regularly at the dojo? Is uh, Kim Ross. I told him I'll speak to you every now and then, so he sends his regards. But he's back training with us regularly. Nice and relax again. Let gravity do the work. Find your balance point. Keep the heels on the ground if you can. Relax. Relax, relax. Push forward. Hip flexor stretching, very important. And around. Chico, left shoulder in. Stretch the spine a little. Both arms down. Nice and wide. Oh, boomy. Okay, the first principle, if you're taking notes, is a very simple one. We've covered it before, but we will. Uh, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a good guy and he's back training. Very nice man. Um, the first principle. I'll go through a couple. BRATS. The acronym BRATS is how to optimize power in your own body. It doesn't take into account uh, leverage and so on when you're involved with a second person. That's the second half. But BRATS stands for... Oh, Rob. Good to see you, man. Uh, uh, BRATS stands for balance, rhythm, or relaxation, accuracy, timing, and speed. Rhythm and timing, for all intents and purposes, we don't think about it often in this way, but rhythm and timing are essentially the same thing. The only difference is 
for me anyway, the way I interpret it, is timing in, is more involved with your interaction with an outside force or an opponent, whereas rhythm is involved with the coordination of all the body parts in the having them in the right place at the right time. So the balance is very important. And the, the next thing that I'm doing with the body weight distribution is what allows the balance to come really good. So balance, rhythm and relaxation, uh, accuracy, timing and speed. Now those together give you power. Okay, so one of the most important things you can do as an instructor with students is if you like, discourage them from trying to generate too much power, but encourage them to try and generate rhythm and relaxation and that sort of thing, okay? Because that, that rhythm in the body, and that's why sometimes I put a metronome on uh, in training, and we... And I might even turn this metronome on uh, if I remember. Um, but so with that in mind... We then transfer into the principles of body weight distribution. For your feet, okay? So we're fighting away and someone rushes in and they're trying to throw punches. Where's the body weight? On the front leg. So they throw the back hand and the body weight is still on the front leg and this is what happens. This foot starts to skate across the ice. You've seen that. They come in and they're really, and then they'll go, oh, and the, the foot will slide out because they're not punching with their body and with rhythm. The hand is working at a different timing and rhythm and speed and, and so on to the rest of the body. Okay? So the first principle of Power generation, besides the brats, is one simple one. Have your weight on your left leg for your left punch. Have your weight on the right leg for the right punch. Okay, now that's something that we've always worked on, but what Benny the Jet taught me uh, is a little simple way to help that and ensure that is to simply lift the heel. So when you throw the punch, you lift that heel. Bang. When you throw the punch with the right leg, you lift the heel. Okay? Doesn't mean lift the heel with the weight still on the left leg. Weight on the left leg for left punch. Weight on the right leg for right punch. But to generate, combine that and generate the power, heel comes up on the left punch, and look, my weight, it's almost like I'm sitting down on a chair sit back on the right for the right punch. One, two. Now, to get that rhythm, heel comes up, heel comes up. Just there. You can just play a rhythm. And I literally have the students in the dojo, they'll just, they'll do this. Move around as their shadow sparring. Lift the heels. Lift the heel. Lift the heel. You can tell the ones that do makiwara and the ones that don't because often when the ones that don't do makiwara do it, they will come bring their weight to the left leg on the right punch. But one of the beauties of the makiwara is it teaches you to get the weight on the correct leg. The main difference is you'll see traditional makiwara, though they won't lift the heel because they use the heel to generate power, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But what we're doing is we're lifting the heel here and we're lifting the heel there. If you want to generate power with a hard, solid blow, sure, leave the heel down. But if you want to ge generate power with, with speed and combinations, you can't leave your heel on the ground. Sorry, if you do it and you, you're good at it, you need to teach me how. But generally speaking, when you're moving with speed, you need to always have one heel off the ground. So that's what we call default position in the seven stages of Kumite. Our default position is knees are bent and the back heel is off the ground. 
okay? A lot of people have the heel on the ground. As soon as the heel goes down, you have no tendon reflex. You have no opportunity to take advantage of the stretch shorten cycle, okay? So we're there. Heel up for left hand. Heel up on the right leg for the right hand. One, two, one, two, one, two. Now, a way that you can work that, a way that you can work that is a very simple principle of numbers. Can you see that ball? Oh, you can, there's a speed ball. Good. The left, everything on the left side is an odd number, everything on the right side is an even number. So we just go, we call the numbers. One, four. one. A one is a front hand oiski. One. Specifically a jawline oiski. One. Or a left jab. One. And when we practice it, we try to teach the shrug and don't throw the punch very far. Because the further you throw it, the easier it is to disconnect the arm from the body. And so that's next thing you know you're doing this and you're not incorporating the body. So one, one, one. Hand, everything stays unchanged. The back hand stays unchanged. So, what's the objective of this drill? Work the habit of lifting the heel. One, 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 one. That's a one. Okay, a two, obviously, right hand, odd, uh, even numbers. A two is a, a gyakuski or a jordan gyakuski. But my objective is not about trying to see how hard I can hit with the punch. That is the last thing I worry about. I've got to deal with the balance, the relaxation, the accuracy, the timing, and the speed. Once I get that, the power is already there. I never want to try and hit with power. I want to hit with balance. I want to hit with rhythm and relaxation and accuracy and timing and speed. And then before you know it, you've got the power. Okay, so one of the worst things you can ever say to a student is try to hit really hard with power because all of a sudden things start to get out of order. Okay, so just hit soft. One, one, one. See the heel comes up. One, 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 one. There's fine details about hiding the jaw behind the, the shoulder and um, twisting the arm and things like that. But we won't worry about that. We're just worried about body weight distribution. One, one. Now the right leg. Two. See that? One, two. One, two. It's a little bit tricky in this respect. You throw the left hand because it's a lead, it's a snap. So it goes out and straight back. Like that. You want to try and make it sharp. But the right, because it's a back shot, you can't easily hit and pull it back. It takes a lot of training. So what you do is you actually hit and let it relax. Rather than this one leads out, snaps it, snaps out and snaps back. Boom, boom. This one, you can't snap out and snap back because you take, you don't get enough power generated through correct body weight if you do that. Okay, so one of the best things you can do is you punch, and when it reaches it, the extent of its range, you just relax and you kind of loop it back. You don't snap it back along the same line. You hit, relax, and just let it come back. <clears throat> so when you practice it, first of all, you have the body weight, the heel coming up, the body weight going to the right leg, and the arm just collapses as it comes back. You notice, look, it just collapses as it comes back. Not straight back like that. With the right hand or the back hand, if you're southpaw, you, you just want to collapse it and let it come back. Boom. Left hand, out and back, out and back, along the straight line. Right hand, let it collapse and relax. And this really holds even true for Kyogashin tournaments. You let that right hand go through and you get good penetration through the spleen and the ribs, okay? The left hand shoots in towards the spine, into the liver, and uh, cuts back again because 
it's your front hand, maybe you want to bring it over the top, or in Kyogushin tournament, you want to bring it back again. But anyway, left hand, left foot, one, one. Right hand, right foot, notice the heel comes up, the body weight goes back to the right leg, and the arm collapses. Now this, many of you probably think this is extremely simplistic, and I know all this, but when I travel and watch people, knowing it intellectually and actually having it as part of the burned in neurological firing of the body, I find is very different. And it's really worth developing that a lot. Tiberio. Yes, good. If you want to know how to punch, ask a boxer. Well, to a point, because boxing doesn't allow kick. So if a boxer tries to throw a punch at you, uh, the legs are very vulnerable because their stance is long. A, a boxer will be in a sunshin stance, but it'll be a very long stance. So it's almost like this. You can hardly see the back foot. If, all the time when you're moving in a, in a boxing stance, you want to hide the back foot. I can't move around because the camera is in the same angle. But if, if you want to do that, you hide the back foot all the time because that allows you to load properly. But when you're dealing with kicks, that back foot actually starts to shorten and come around a little bit, and this foot has to straighten more because of the danger of thigh kicks. Separate issue, but boxers, by all means, punch uh, better than anyone. So left, right, one, two. So you emphasize the heel lift, not the punch. One, two, one, two. See that? One, two, one, two. Weight left, weight right. Weight left, weight right. Weight left, weight right. Weight left, weight right. One, two, three, four. We used to do this with the split. So with the split footwork drill, you split off, rotate around, your weight goes left, your weight goes right. So see this? Wave motion. Boom, boom. So it's the same thing. One, two, one. See this? Weight left, weight right. Weight left, weight right. One, two, one, two. So a really good way to work mitts. Uh, I'll see if I can get Josh along next week and show you the, the, how we use the mitts. But if you ever use mitts in training, and it's a fantastic tool, try not to, my personal opinion, Try not to get them to hit left into left and right into right. Get them to hit left and right into right. There's a whole bunch of reasons which I'll explain when we do it. But anyway, one, two, one, two. Now, that transfers this static sunshine, um, Aguchi static sunshine, into more dynamic motion now. But now we have to work on transitions. So that's where footwork comes in. And one key principle you can think about is it doesn't matter how good your technique is. You can have perfect technique in basics, but if you have no footwork, you are pretty well ineffective. On the other hand, if your technique is half good, but your footwork is outstanding, you'll be infinitely more effective straight away. Us good to see you, Gay. Matus Porlaski, Us, Jindobre. How are you? Gay, good morning, eh? Good to see you, Gay. Tiberi, that's why we do jumping rope so we can have the heels up when we are moving around in a fight. Uh Tiberio, I reckon you've got a spy in the dojo. Because that's exactly what we were talking about at training on Monday night, oh no, on Wednesday, uh, is the importance of skipping. And we were talking about it to one of my buddies who's about my age. So you start to lose the knees. You lose the explosiveness in your knees. But when you work on the skipping, it, it, boom, boom. it teaches you, it allows you to keep the heel off the ground all the time so you get that movement nice sharp movement off the heel but yeah very good point and if you're skipping you'll know that skipping is a good 
illustration of what you can and can't do in fighting because if you try and skip on your heels, it's kind of hard. So you need the spring of your ankles. And you go all the way back to traditional Kyogoshin movement in Zen Kutsu. If you watch my front foot, some people still move the front foot first and step through, which was which is wrong. So, so I was very adamant. And that happens more and more and more as you get tired, simply because if I'm propping correctly, you know, 60, 65% or so of weight on my front leg, if I turn my heel, my foot, I start to fall forward. So that's why people do it. When they're a little lazy, it's a really easy way to move forward. But for training, what you really should be doing is using the drive of the back ankle. So that foot doesn't move, this foot does, just like we were doing before. So now when I step through in Zen Kutsu, my objective, pull from tandem, drive from ankle, okay? I don't turn my front foot, it simply turns naturally as the other one goes past it. Okay, so that's a good point Tibera is bringing up about uh, heels. Is Solsai Oyama training with Bolsai Tonkra? Well, you know, Solsai wrote in his book, What is Karate, that uh, when he went to the mountains to train, he took with him uh, bow, um, spear, uh, the Naginata spear as well, the Yari spear. So he was very interested in training in weapons uh, in the early days. But uh, if my interpretation is correct that was more so he could understand how to deal with weapons in an armed situation so he needed to know the uh, limitations of weapons and so on a lot of people are doing a lot of people are doing uh, weapons these days and you know all through you look at uh, um, Kyogoshin history through the years in Australia we had Brian Ellison who was one of my instructors and Brad Madam, who took probably, I'd say, the best nunchaku uh, exponents in Australia. And then Jeff Weibrow, Shihan in England, who was uh, extremely good at um, nunchaku. So it's a personal thing. I don't know that it's taught Kyokushin Khan. They're introducing more weapons, mainly Sai and Bo. But anyway, that's all I really know about that because um, I've done very little. One of our senpai in our club spent a lot of time on, oh, yeah, Cuba training boxes and came back with these drills. They're really valuable, but as you say, they require a lot of work. We, I'd be re really interested to find out more about the drills you're talking about, or do you mean they're similar to um, the ones we're doing? Vinny. <laughs> Vinny, Vince, Vince Le Motard. He remembers me teaching him this when he came out and stayed with me in Australia. To me, the great Muhammad Ali had the best footwork. Yeah, he's, his footwork's pretty good. I'd say um, Roy Jones Jr. had amazing footwork. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, no one can deny the fact that he was probably the most successful boxer ever. Anyway, I see. Same with you. That's interesting, Torbjorn. Very interesting. Mac, sprinters have fast feet. If they run with spikes on their shoes, on their shoes, on, yeah. Yeah, the spikes are on the ball of the the heels hardly even touch the ground. And um, I know Mitch Kachonda, that um, one of our black belts, he's an athletic conditioning, athletic preparation coach, and they do a lot of uh, work for sprinters, especially on range of motion and ankle uh, extension, explosion. Yeah, Brian was in Mad Max 4, that's correct, using his knives. Well, you're asking kind of questions, Matus, which require a long, deep answer. But yes, obviously, if it wasn't good for self-defense, then, then it's useless. Um, so this is where a lot of people now train simply for tournaments. So they lost that connection to self-defense. And now it's one of my uh, loves anyway to try and bring that reality back in, Matus. So we have... Kicking range, we have punching range, we have headbutt elbow range, 
we have stand up grappling range and we have take down ground range you have to cover all of those because self-defense requires a knowledge of all of those so well that's good to know Torbjorn so this drill I can't tell you too much how good it is we do it all the time in the dojo we get the kids for a part of our warm-up we'll just walk down the hall doing shadow sparring but often we'll just be doing the heels well we hardly get progress just moving like this and as they lift the left heel they'll throw any sort of left punch You've got a straight left, a hook, an uppercut, a rip to the body, a straight to the body. These are all punches. And as you lift the left heel, see this? Concentrate just on one heel to start with. You get a heck of a workout in the legs too. But we just focus on lifting the left heel and, and get that rhythm so that the body now is coordinating. And what is coordination? It's all about, as Benny the Jet says, making all the weapons of your body work as one. Left hand, left hand, left hand, left hand, left hand, left hand, left hand. Lift the heel, throw the left hand. Now you throw the right as you lift the right heel. Then you put them together, left, right, left, right. That's a one Two, one, two. Here's a good little rhythm you can do on mitts. That's a one. Left hook is three. A left uppercut. Five. A left shot to the body straight is a seven. And a left liver shot is a nine. So you have one, three, Five, we can leave the seven out sometimes. One, three, five, and nine. Okay? Now, if you want to put a nice combination together, you simply throw the right two every time. So one, two, three, two, five, two, five again, two. Step forward, nine, two. Rotate off, two. Uppercut, two. Left, two, one. Two, three, two, five, two, in, nine, two. That sort of rhythm. So you get that idea. You don't have to be too sophisticated with your combinations. One of the, one of the worst things about training karate is we think as we go up in the ranks, we have to become more and more sophisticated. But the reality is, as you go up in ranks, you just get better and better at the fundamentals. Okay? So also used to say the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And sometimes people would grumble, yeah, you've heard him say it a thousand times. And so also I'd say, well, I'll say it another thousand times until you get it. Okay, so you have to you hear it over and over and over. So for the body weight distribution, a simple, effective drill. Weight on left for left with the heel up. Weight on right for right with the heel up. One, two. That's a one, two, three, two. Five, two, step forward, nine, two. You just do that and move around. One, two, three, two, five, two, nine, and two. So whenever you turn, rotate off, you take advantage of that stretch shorten cycle, that little, boom, that little movement off there, there like that. So when you rotate off, you, you use that for your right. Because remember the weight's on the right. So you use a tendon reflex on the right, and put power in the punch. One, two, three, two, five. See how I'm lifting my heels? One, two. Heels, heels, left heel, right heel. That's a really solid, simple drill that you can use. Tai Sabaki is mainly found out here. Tai Sabaki is actually. Okay, let me talk about that for a sec. Ashihara Karate and Sabaki are known for Tai Sabaki, but Tai Sabaki is just a Japanese word that just means move. Move, move, move. You'll hear them in tournaments. Sabaite, sabaite. Okay, so Tai Sabaki literally means movement, body movement. 
But because it has a Japanese word, we kind of assign this concept that it's unique to that word, but it literally just means body movement. Uh, it's essentially, uh, it's always been in Kyogushin. Anything that takes you out of the dead zone on a circular motion is Taisabaki. So uh, boxers do Taisabaki. Um, wrestlers do tons of Taisabaki because everything is changing angles in the wrestling. Uh, everything is Taisabaki. Judo is all about Taisabaki. So Taisabaki is definitely not new and it's not unique to Ashihara or uh, Enshin. It's just that they used the word. They were probably the first ones to actually introduce the word in a big way. Until then, Masayama used to, if you read Masayama's books in Japanese, it has the word Sabaki and Taisabaki in it, in the Japanese version. But when it was translated, it wasn't translated as Tai Sabaki. It was translated as movement, circular motion, movement, circle and point, rhythm, movement. That's all Tai Sabaki. Um, uh, but it's very important, um, and it, it has made uh, Ashihara Kaikan and Enshin Karate very, very popular because it does teach that beautiful circular motion. Back in 1980s, Nakanawa, Higo and Morio Sensei would take us on a run, then walk back to the dojo, walking on the ball of the feet. Wow. The feel in the legs was very different from normal. Yes. Uh, I know when we work, I work with football teams as well, uh, working on tackling, and everything is on the ball of the feet. It's a good point. You know, even when we're working on drills, we, we call fast feet drills for tackling and we're here and we're doing this and, and it's just all the heels never touch the ground we're like this Boom, and then you move so one guy's running these are tackling drills that we used to do and i used to import a lot of karate concepts into the tackling drills for the football teams so boom, 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 and that allows you then to move quickly you get the tendon reflex so uh nothing happens on the heels except a good back kick <laughs> hmm. I missed the cons that everyone's mentioning for making my student do not well shin seasoning you should just wear shin pads in kumite and carefully kick and even with the shin pads on your shins will start to get conditioned then you can start to work um, punching bags and for knuckle push-ups, you just got to do it. It's literally only a few days when your nerves are completely not used to a hard surface. It's just that. And then after a while, you, you don't even feel it anymore. Torbjorn. Yep, there's no sense striking with weak on Yes, very good. In advanced karate, also I wrote something about Liu Sui Waza, meaning dodge. Yes, Liu Sui. Literally means flowing water. Liu Sui. It means that. So it means boom. That sort of motion. Motion. Salsa was particularly good at that. We we look back at Salsa and we see the photos of him in his fifties and sixties, but we don't recognise that when he was in his twenties and thirties, he was fearsome. He um, uh, Oishi Shihan talks about some of the experiences that they had uh, training with him when he was, you know, already in his thirties. Uh, so imagine training with Masayama when he's in his mid-30s. They used to say that the dojo would be open for five or six hours. People would come and go all the time. And if there are 100 people came into the dojo, one Masayama would spar 100 of them without fail every single time. Um, he never let anyone go home without having sparred him. Uh, and not only that, um, Oishi Shihan, who's famous for his own speed, for his kicks and so on, he just said... They used to go back to the dormitory and so on after training, and it was breathtaking to think about how fast Solsai was. He said, lots of people talk about speed and describe speed, and he says, but Masayama was so fast that um, it was incomprehensible. But anyway, so yes, he talks about Liu Sui, that dodging and moving, that sort of thing. It's just, it just means... Liu Sui basically just means head movement, boom, bang, boom, like that, move your head, all that stuff. Um, 
Uh, I haven't seen Filio's training, Mac. You have to send me some links. But I have no doubt Filio's, you know, very powerful. I'm going to try to the term Tenshin, usually similar to Taisabaki. Tenshin. I'd, I'd be interested to know the kanji. Is that like point ten and shin heart? So I haven't got my, I didn't bring my iPad to do the kanji for you. But uh, anyway, I'd be interested to know that. Vince Taisabaki, that's it. It's also practice bunkai. Yes, of course. In fact, if you look at his books, very there's of all his books, only about thirty between thirty thirty five percent of the techniques were applicable to tournaments. The other sixty to sixty five to seventy percent uh, of the techniques were uh, illegal tournament techniques. So they were bunkai taken techniques out of um, out of context with tournaments, but very practical for real fighting. Yes, Paul, I agree. Um, Harry, not what, what What do you mean, what about when making contact? It was, Paul, yes, indeed. Oh, man, that must have been amazing. We jog around the dojo on the balls of our feet instead of on the heels. Well, yes, good. You should do that anyway. Any any um, any running should never be on the heels. The only time you hit on the heels is when you're doing long distance where you just let the momentum of the body go. So you're trying to um, – yeah, he did in the first world tournament, Brad. So anyway, I just want to finish off now, in the last 10, 15 minutes. Um, you get the idea of the body. That's Liu Sui. Vince has written the kanji for Liu Sui there, flowing water, Liu Sui. But anyway, you get the idea. Wait on left for left, wait on right for right, lift the heel and just play with that rhythm. Put music on, if you like. I don't have any music here. But just, you know, music, form. just work this idea of rhythm. You're looking for rhythm. Okay, you don't want power. Power is a product of having all the other parts of the body working at the, in the correct way. Boom. Heel up, heel up, heel, 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 heel. Bang. Chain, tendon reflex. Boom. See when you turn, shoulder, hip, turn, tendon reflex. Bang. Heel, 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 heel. I used to train a boxer, Tyrone Tongi. He was one of my uchideshi. He was strong at karate too, but he got went into pro boxing. And became the uh, he retired under feet of the Australian light middleweight champion. But anyway, uh, Tyrone, uh, when um, uh, Chock, what's Chock's name? Who can tell me what Chock's name is? Um, that Australian champion boxer. He was a footy player, Chock. I can't believe who can tell me what Chock's name is. Um, I used to watch his dad box. But anyway, uh, this fantastic boxer uh, came to Brisbane. And yes, that's correct, Dave Bunt. Ten, as in Kate Ten, yes. Anthony, yeah, Anthony Mundine, Paul. Thanks, buddy. But Anthony Mundine uh, was in Brisbane. Whenever he'd come to Brisbane to, um, to train, he'd contact Tyrone and ask Tyrone to come and be his sparring partner. Um, and uh, of course I was Tyrone's trainer so I used to be there when they were training and you watch Tony Mundine when he's warming, warm, warming up and he put music on and this is his warm up All he's doing is innovating the body to act as a single unit. I don't think I ever saw him throw a full punch unless he was actually sparring. But his warm-up is simply this. Wait, 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 wait. Wait on left, wait on right, wait on left, wait on right. Boom, boom, tap down, tap down over, tap down over. Boom, get the rhythm. That's all he used to do. Okay, so we'll keep going. Yep, Gary used a lot of music. We always had music going on in the dojo, especially the Uchideshi training and so on. We still do now. Yes, the book, good for bringing it up, Harry. The um, book's going great. Uh, it's on the ships. It's out. It's on its way. Uh, it's just a matter of waiting. I just hope they have peaceful seas between Hong Kong and here. Oh, it's Rochelle. You made it. Good on you. Rochelle's been doing uh, post-grad student exams and things like that all night. Um, 
Um, but anyway, the book's going great. And unfortunately for some countries, Northern European, Europe, Northern Europe and Canada and so on, they have some still have some strict COVID uh, conditions in, so we're not allowed to ship there immediately. So it could take a little longer. But they'll be they're on their way to New Zealand. The ships have left for New Zealand, USA, and Australia. So that's all good news. Yeah, Transformers, not to mention, um, yeah, we could probably hear Transformers in the background at Margaret Street. That's true. Yes, so the book's um, available, and uh, we're looking to do an Indian version. But anyway, look, um, well, Rochelle's the, uh, Rochelle's the professor. She's the one uh, working with the post-grad students. So uh, she's been overseeing papers and exams all night, one-on-ones, that sort of thing. Uh, never mind. Don't worry about it, Vince. Um, we'll keep in touch. But anyway, so to finish off, we, we kind of ran over with the, the, the rhythm, but you can't overemphasize it. If you do nothing, if you don't do kumite for three months, but focus on the idea of relaxing and feeling the power come through the body off the legs, left hand, uppercut, hook, a rip, boom, throw the right, throw the right, heel comes off the ground when you do it. Okay, that's very important. Um, and, and for footwork, well, we've run out of time, but I just want instructors especially to work with students on fundamental footwork. Okay, so we work the split, boom, around there, work the split that way, work the split that way, always let the cops come up, but forward and back, footwork, I want you to work at half shuffle and back, half shuffle and back, it's all about efficiency, half, back, full, back, half, back, so I used, when I used to fight tournaments, I'd go, I bring the foot up here, boom, and I move. Bring the foot up and bring the foot back, boom. And I'd be moving like this all the time. And then when you get the rhythm, you get the timing, you wouldn't bring it back, you go forward. So I go forward, back, forward, back, forward, forward. And you go like that and you bridge the gap and go in, okay? So the first footwork pattern, half shuffle. There, see that? You're in this position, half shuffle, half shuffle back. People say you should never bring your feet together because you get kicked. Well, if you do it in the at a time when they're gonna kick you, well then that's a bit silly. You're only moving that when you're in control of things. Okay, then half shuffle is turned into a full shuffle. So that can be the step dip. They kind of get used to how far I'm here, I can reach there, back, there, back. And then next one, I drive all the way through and you get that extension. So we've got half shuffle. You can't overemphasize this. My students will do this for an entire half a class. They'll start here. They'll work on three basic shuffles, to, uh, three basic steps to start with. Half shuffle, full shuffle, step through, half shuffle, full shuffle, and step through. And you go back, half, full, step, half, full, step, and back around. So you work those three. I'll see if I can do it here so you can see. Half shuffle, full shuffle, step through. Half shuffle, full shuffle, step through. And you just get your students doing that, trying not to throw punches. We don't allow them to throw punches more than 15, 20 centimetres from their face, just like that. So they're doing the half shuffle, the full shuffle. Half shuffle, full shuffle. Step through, half shuffle, full shuffle. Step through. I reckon Christian Dunn has done plenty of this because he trained with us for years. They're the first three foot patterns. Then you you add in the circular motion because you've got to get out of. This is really simple stuff, but very few dojos do enough of it. 
Okay, so if you just incorporate, first of all, that body weight drill and then these uh, footwork drills, everything will change. Half shuffle, full shuffle. Notice my upper body on the half and full doesn't change. I don't go. I only change my body on the full step. I keep my body wedged that way. Half shuffle. So the upper body shouldn't move. That's why it's deceptive. Full shuffle. Step through. You can do the same back. Half shuffle. Full shuffle. Step through. Half shuffle. Full shuffle. Step through. Half shuffle. Full shuffle. Step through. And then you add the, the lateral movement. So you bring the foot back to yoi, basically. So I'm there. Back to yoi. Move off to the side. Bring my foot back. Move off to the side. To go left, I simply split. So I take one leg forward, one leg back, and work circular. Boom. That way. That way. So here's my dead zone in front of my opponent. I, I want to move, attack straight in when he attacks. I'm going to split off to the side and attack at that angle now. Back to the middle. As he attacks, I split off to this side. Come back in that way. Or if you want, split off here straight away and then use that rhythm once again. Change angles again that way. So the three footwork drills for beginners especially, but when I say beginners, it could be anyone up to third or fourth down who haven't got the fundamental footwork right. One, half shuffle. Two, full shuffle. Notice the upper body doesn't change. And three is a step through. Step through all the way to there. They're the first three footwork drills. Probably do a whole session on that one day, but I think they're really valuable drills, especially when you start to work on um, penetrating steps. Remember uh, Coach Dan Higgins came a couple of weeks ago. We work on the penetration step and so on to bridge the gap, remember? That's what we're doing. We're working a half shuffle and then a penetration step. So you might remember Dan was working on the idea to change levels. So he was coming in. He was doing a, a step through, right, left, dropping, and then he wasn't going to the ground, but it doesn't hurt to go to the ground for the drill. So we're here, power, power, drop, and step through and do the shot. Okay, so that level change uh, is really important in the uh, transition from one range to the next. is very vital, and it's an area which we need to address in Kyokushin. You think about it, you think about the, uh, um, the, the things, one of the best things you can do, we have what we call the quintessential questions, <laughs> the quintessential way at waltz is that the, the, the simple questions that we do after training every time is we ask three questions. What did I do well today? What didn't I do well today? And what am I going to do about it uh, tomorrow? Okay, so the 80-20 concept of training is you find the thing you need to work on most. Most people get it around the wrong way because of the ego. If they're really good at kicks, they spend all their time just tapping people with their roundhouse kick. Okay, it's the wrong attitude. What you want to do is you go, okay, well, my roundhouse kick is pretty good, so that'll be the 20 part. What have I got to do to, to improve the 80%? And it may simply be, one or two footwork drills. That one or two footwork drills, getting the body weight, uh, getting the rhythm, the, the ball, the brats. Okay, and I mentioned that there's a second part to that acronym. It's bald brats like that. The bald part is, um, is the breathing, angles, leverage, and distance. So you coordinate your breathing. You, you watch very carefully. You get their rhythm. If you can hit a guy with a half-baked punch right at the right time when he's breathing going in, it'll have a bigger effect than if you hit him with a power shot and he and his breathing is prepared. Okay, so the bald part, the brats, balance, relaxation, uh, uh, accuracy, timing, and speed. That's the acronym 
for what's inside you when you're training. The bald breaths is the bald part is when you're interacting with an outside force or an opponent or a training partner. So that's when it becomes the breathing, the angles, the leverage, and the distance. And that's what optimizes your power. The two of those put together is what creates uh, optimal power. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, um, it's really a real pleasure to have Kim and Peter Collis and Kim Ross there, man. Um, it's a real honor. I the past made a comment to you about putting the hand out onto the knee to divert, to divert a kick. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a good solid practice. Uh, if you can time it well, just tap the hand and it, it, it um, neutralizes the power of the kick. Um, so take that as a drill. Heel, the heel drill. You can actually put music on and you don't even throw the punches. Let's just review that. Um, the heel drill, you can actually start just here. Boom. Feel the weight left, weight right, weight left, weight right, weight left, weight right. And then left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand. You're doing it with a half shuffle there. Left, right, left, right, left. Right, left, right, back. Full shuffle. Full shuffle back. Step through. Step back. Work those sort of drills. And then you add some hands. And then you add the numbers. One, two, three, two, five, two, seven, two. And nine, two. Okay, those sort of drills are very simple but very effective drills. You can start to incorporate. I'm doing a whole series of videos, would you believe? I've got some really exciting news, which it's not 100%, so I'm not going to say anything about it yet. Uh, but uh, putting together the membership website, we we're preparing a, about a 1,000 videos on everything from how to make the fist correctly all the way through to Bunkai for the advanced cutter. And that's a very exciting project over the next couple of years, and I have a couple of very good people to work with me. Uh, good on you, Rochelle. Yeah, Rochelle's been hard at it, burning the midnight oil of the academic all night, so good on you for coming. Um, and we had, Rochelle, you may not have realised, but we had um, Dave Bunt uh, was here. I think Bunt or Sensei may have gone to bed because it would be about 1am in New York at the moment. But uh, Banto Sensei was a very important person uh, at Hombu in Japan, working with Solsai for a long, long time. And uh, there was a little story about that photo of uh, Solsai and me at Niagara Falls. And I, Solsai had my gi on and I had his on, so we told the little story. Yes, the Oyashi Kaiten, the Okuriyashi Oyashi Kaiten. All of them, they, they, um, they uh, all have um, Japanese names, of course, but they're all pretty simple. So anyone, anyway, folks, thank you very much. Appreciate your time again. I always enjoy this because it brings me together with the worldwide family. Uh, and um, Patreon, you, you, you saved my life. Um, so thank you very much to the Patreon family. Uh, you know, um, I really appreciate it. Also, I've, what I've done, I've got my Phyto, you see my Phyto t-shirt on today. So Daniel Casarell, if you're out there, all power to Phyto. But anyway, for Australians who want to order the book, I've created a new Australian-only uh, website. I mean, anyone can go to it, but what it does, it allows you to order the book uh, in Australian dollars so you don't have to uh, worry about exchange rates and so on. But anyway, that's that. Us. So thank you, everybody. Excuse me. Always appreciate you coming along. Oh, us, Banto Sensei, still there. Good on you. Dave, really, really nice to see your name pop up. And I really appreciate you joining in. Uh, and um, 
I'm glad you did. You know, it's very easy to spin yarns. You notice people change the history. There's a couple of people I've got in mind, but um, like I interpreted for a lot of meetings for SoulSci and then later on people 20, 30 years later, they think you won't remember, but I keep log. I've got my red books. My wife laughs about it wherever I go. I've got my red book. Um, but uh, you don't forget the history. And my nephew Christian went up to, he got transferred to Thursday Island, and I was at Thursday Island 45 years ago. So I used to tell stories about my experiences and the people I was hanging with. And they're, they're all larger than life, very almost too incredible to believe tales. But sure enough, Christian gets transferred there 40 years later. Well, if I told lies about it, he would have found out and he'd have no respect at all. Well, it's the same with Banto Sensei coming along. Um, he tells a story uh, about our geese. So anyway, I really appreciate seeing your name there. Us, Christopher Fox. Um, yeah, try the rhythm and the metronome, but soften up, Kostav, soften, soften, boom. Don't hit, don't hit. Just go with the rhythm like you're dancing, boom, boom. None of this business, okay, not that sort of dancing. Just get the rhythm right there like that. Us, everyone, have a good weekend, and I look forward to seeing you. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate you coming along. It's a real honour. Us, see you all. See you next week.